10 a.m. on the dot, I'll start. So some people will hear my intro and some people won't. That's okay. Uh, welcome to everybody today. Thanks so much for coming and joining us on the Zebra Developer Talk. Um, we're excited to share with you today. Uh, Ian Hanton is here to present. I just wanted to do a few housekeeping um, items with you all and give you some updates on where we're at with uh, Zebra Developer Nation. Um, we invite you to join our community. If you are not already a member, it's free to join. All kinds of content rich information there for you as developers. Um, so if you go to developer.zebra.com, you can view it anytime and also register online to receive all of our news and events. Uh, this upcoming year, we're really excited to share a couple of different things. First, next month, um, our session is uh, Mobility DNA, and that will, <clears throat> excuse me, that will be with um, Darren Campbell. Um, so please look forward to that invitation, and the news will be posted on the developer portal and also on our partner portal. You can register. We'll also socially promote it, so if you find us out there in Twitterland, we'll will be up there. Um, and then in the coming months, we are currently planning for our Zebra DevCon, our developer-focused uh, conference, uh, which will be the, uh, the first part of November of this year. We are uh, targeting Europe at this time to be in person. We are very hopeful that we will all be in a better world at that point and we can all see you in person because uh, we would love to see you there. Um, and we will also um, promote it virtually as well. So if you can't be there in person, you can be there virtually. Um, so watch in the coming months, there will be information that will be posted in a variety of our developer news channels and we'll make sure that we get that information to you. So everybody fingers crossed. Um, today's session, if there's any questions that you have for Ian, we'll hold those to the end. What I'd ask you to do is go in the question uh, box in your webinar and just go ahead and put it there just as you think about it. Um, you can just go ahead and post it there and at the end uh, we'll post those questions to Ian uh, to provide uh, some responses to us. As always, if you need to get a hold of us afterwards and you feel like you have a really crucial question you need to ask us, you are always welcome to email us at developer at zebra.com and we're happy to address it there. Um, we will be recording this session as we do with all of our dev talks. Uh, it'll go up immediately and go to webinar, um, probably within a few hours after the talk for anybody who wants to view it right away. And then the final version will be up on our portal and also up on our YouTube developer playlist. So please look at those uh, two communication channels if you wanna take a look at it later on or share it with anybody. And with that, I. I am going to turn it over to Ian. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Stacy. I think I was trying to unmute myself at the same time, but um, can you hear me okay? Hello? Can I hear Stacey? you? We're, go yeah. we're all good. Yeah, sorry, there seems good. to be a little delay in trying to get that to function. Yeah, okay, no problem. Right, thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, this is a dev talk which is concerned with how to test exported XML uh, before either deploying it through an EMM, which is the usual way you would process it, or you could also process it uh, through a stage now profile if you wanted to work in raw XML rather than using um, stage now to build a profile completely. Um, there's a little cartoon there, I'm not going to read it out, but that's quite amusing. That's probably my sense of humor, but uh, it's how to spot a tester in the supermarket. So you can have a look at that. Um, the agenda is we're going to look at uh, OEM config which is the method that we've provided for our EMM partners to be able to process raw XML. Um, and so we'll look at that in a bit more detail. We're going to look at a demonstration of doing that actually with a, a EMM 
which is uh, the WYSI EMM, which is a, a French company. Um, French ISV for Zebra is providing a, an EMM tool based on the Google Android um, management APIs. We're going to look at um, how you can rapidly test exported XML. That's the main focus is how you can test it and make sure it's working before you deploy through an EMM. And we're also going to look at some, hopefully some useful configuration samples of some things you can do with XML uh, quite easily, which can be useful when you push them out through a device management tool. So as Stacey said, if you have any questions, um, just put them in the chat box as we go along and we'll hopefully have time at the end to, um, to go through those. So OEM config, this is basically a new interface to the proprietary APIs we expose, which are part of the Zebra mobility extensions or the MX layer. And what it does is it removes the requirement for EMMs to develop a custom, either custom code or a custom interface in order to use those um, MX extensions. So if you go back before we had OEM config as an option, it was necessary, say, for a partner such as SOTI to produce an agent which included support for the latest features of MX. And that basically required a lot of um, churn in terms of new versions of the client. So it's very time consuming. Uh, it normally requires a change also on the console side as well in order to be able to, to actually include those features. So with OEM config, you can move away from that completely. And it's kind of a self-updating solution. So what we do is we push out a new version of OEM config, the actual client, which is on Google Play. And when you run OEM config, or when an EMM client runs OEM config, it basically allows the EMM to interrogate the device in order to understand its capability in terms of what MX APIs it supports. So it's basically the device is publishing its capability to the EMM server. And then the EMM server can present a, a user interface which only exposes the features which are supported by that particular version of OEM config. So it is a really good way of making sure that your devices or your, your EMM always supports the current feature set of the devices without having to make any code changes. So that's basically the, the main advantage. Um, it does require an EMM client, so you can't currently use OEM config without using it in conjunction with an EMM. And it does require GMS features to be enabled. So not a good idea to enable our GMS restricted mode because that will break the connection with the EMM and normally it will stop this solution from working. So there's a diagram there that just basically covers that in uh, in a di diagram format. As I said, um, the device when it connects to the EMM will publish its schema in terms of its the features it supports. That schema is imported into the console, and you'll see when we actually do the demonstration that you can actually go into the OEM config section. And you'll see exactly the features which are supported in your device and you can configure them. Once you do that, you can push out the configuration through the Google Play services back to the device. And then that configuration is processed by the OEM config client on the device in order to actually make the changes on the device side. So it's a two-way communication from the device publishing its capability to modifying its um, parameters and then pushing them back on to the device all through the, the play services. Um, the focus of this presentation really is on using exported XML within OEM config. So one of the, the actual features of OEM config is under the device administration section, 
you have the option to submit XML. And when you enable that, you can then just basically copy and paste raw XML into the submit XML field, which you can see on screen here. And that will allow you to process that XML on the device. Um, so that's how it looks in WYSI. It will vary slightly with different EMMs, but basically you'll have exactly the same options for the same device on the different EMM tools. They just may be presented in a slightly different UI. Um, but the advantage of the WYSI EMM is it, it gives you a very nice, clear and easy to use interface to actually change any of the, um, the parameters of OEM config. Uh, the only point I wanted to highlight here is you need, do need to, to make sure that submit XML is enabled because by default that's disabled. So if you just paste the XML in and don't change that setting and you try and apply the profile, then it won't be processed. And in order to get the raw XML, you can export it very easily from stage now. You go to the, um, the end of the profile. Uh, you have an option at the top of the screen which says export for MDM, export for stage now. You choose export for MDM, it will export the current profile as raw XML into a file that you can save on your PC. And that's an example of some raw XML. In this case, it's to enable um, the Bluetooth radio. And you can see you've got an opening WAP provisioning tag and the closing tag. This is a comment, which is optional. And then you've got the actual XML to, in, to basically um, configure the wireless manager CSP. The CSP is the building block for um, the different components of MX. So we've got multiple C CSPs which cover different functional areas. Wireless manager covers all the, the operation of the, the wireless, like the Bluetooth, the Wi-Fi, and so on. And so within the wireless manager CSP, we're just setting the Bluetooth state to a value of one. Uh, as we'll see later on, somewhat confusingly, one is actually enable and um, two is disable. So yeah, you have to, to keep that in mind when you're working with raw XML. Um, as I said, comments can be embedded in the XML to make it readable. Um, you don't need to have the, the version header tag. So you'll normally have this tag at the top of the file. When the XML is exported, that's kind of optional if you're just processing it through um, OEM config. And also the WAP provisioning open and close tags are also optional. So you can leave those in, it won't affect the processing, but you don't need to have them. So uh, in this, this session, we're gonna use WYSI to demonstrate this. Uh, that's the URL to access the homepage. Uh, as I said, it's an EMM that's focused on using exclusively Google management APIs. So there's nothing really proprietary in there in terms of the APIs they use to talk to the devices. They have a free version available for up to two devices, which has a minimal feature set, but is usable you know, to actually understand how it works and, and to demonstrate. And it's very competitively priced if you compare it with other offerings on the market. So for basic functionality, which excludes the ability to do full remote control, it's uh, $2 per device per month list. So pretty um, competitive in terms of pricing. It does support full remote control on Zebra devices via a plugin. And it also supports the Zebra Phota, which is the firmware over the air uh, solution for deploying full OS images and also lifeguard patches. So we're not going to cover that in detail today, but that's basically a fairly straightforward way to take a device and then to be able to select whatever version of OS or lifeguard patch you want to apply to that device or that group of devices, and it will then push the, that update out to the device directly from the console. So it makes it 
you know, it's a very streamlined process for doing OS updates of devices in the field. So in terms of testing, um, there's a, a utility that I put together here, which is actually discussed at this link. This is a blog that I posted, which talks about using this utility. And it's basically just a very simple app that just simplifies the process of, of creating the XML or modifying it and then pushing it to the device through a cable. So this is for local testing on a PC before deploying through an EMM. And it's using ADB, which is Android Debug Bridge, to push the XML file to the path SD card, which is the internal SD card, slash myxml.xml. So whenever you, you modify or load any XML in this, in this tool and you hit the push button, then it basically just copies that, the XML that's in the panel into that file. And once it's there, we can process that using the batch CSP, which is part of MX. And that's included in this stage now barcode. So what that means is the, the sequence is you load the XML, make any changes that you might want to make. You push the XML to the device, and then you consume it with the barcode at the bottom right. Um, so it just kind of it's really just there as an assistant that helps you to to um, modify XML and push it and test it quickly. And you can start and stop the stage now client using the buttons on screen. You can see that. Um, the other function it's got, which is useful, is a syntax check, because when you change XML, it's quite easy to to create a syntax error. For example, if you miss out one of the brackets, it is very fussy about the syntax. Um, and so hitting syntax check will just load the current XML into the Chrome browser. And what that means is that you can, that will pass the, the XML and it will tell you if you have a syntax error and it will tell you where the error is. So in this case, we've got a, a missing closing bracket and it will tell me error on line seven at column one. So it basically just tells you where the, the error lies in the XML. So you can do an easy and quick syntax check. So there's an alternative to using that tool, which is just to use a standard editor. And if you use an editor such as Notepad++, then you get the advantage then it does the, the color coding of the um, XML syntax. So in this case, you've got green for um, comments and it just basically allows you to, to have a better visual rendering of the XML. Um, so to support that method where you just want to, to work in a text editor, I just created a small batch file which you can add to your send to menu on your PC. And then when you click on the XML file in File Explorer and you send to that batch file, it will push it again through ADB to the same path. So it's really doing the same as the tool, but just in a slightly different way. Allows you to use any text editor. And once you've actually pushed it onto the device, you can use the same method either scan this barcode or else they have it available in a in a separate barcode profile. But it's doing the same thing. It's just using the batch CSP to consume the XML that's in that myxml.xml file. So we're going to look at some samples. I think I actually skipped a slide, which was the one talking about the WYSI um, demonstration. So let me just do that first. So we're going to look at how this works in practice. Um, I've logged on here to the WYSI um, control panel, WYSI console. So you can see in the dashboard, you've got a summary of your, your profiles. You have defined number of users, number of registered devices number of enrolled devices, it just gives you a breakdown. 
Um, if you go to fleet management, you can look at the device list. All my test devices are under the profile name IH Test 3. So I can filter by that profile in order to see just my devices, which you can see here. And the one that I've got connected, which hopefully I'm still connected through Visor, you can see here. So this is the TC52, which is this one. So I can click on that. And in this case, I just see basically a summary of the device in terms of its what the model number is, the serial number, the, the RAM usage. You can go down here to look at your software information in order to see what, what um, build it's got installed. So I'm in a fairly current Android 10 build. And you can also look at hardware information and device settings. So I just give you your basic sort of overview. Um, you can look at applications installed through that tab. You can look at logs and you can also do remote control. Um, I'm not going to do that because I already have the device connected through Visor, which is a bit more flexible for this, this demonstration. So that's just the basic overview of, of the device. The, the thing that's, that we need to use in order to, to actually use OEM config is the profile that's attached to this device, which is I can access by clicking on this link. And in here, I can set up some basic policies, you know, for things like disable camera, disable status bar, and so on. But if I go to the applications tab and scroll down, you can see in this profile, I have OEM config enabled. And if I hit the configuration link here, it basically takes me into the OEM config setup. So, in this case, I've got one transaction step currently. And if I click on that, then you can see here that's a list of all the, the parameters which have been published by this particular device in terms of, in terms of its OEM config capability. Um, so you can go through these and look at the different um, options available. There's a huge overlap, obviously, between what you can configure in some of these uh, sections and what you can configure through raw XML. In most cases, they, they overlap 100%. There are a few things which you can do in XML which you can't do through the just using the standard UI options here. Uh, and there's also with raw XML, there's the ability to combine several steps into one chunk of XML, which may be more convenient to do than, than actually selecting individual options from the menu here but i just wanted to point out there is an overlap and in most cases you know if you wanted to do things like uh disable the the front camera you could do that easily just by clicking on it here rather than by importing the xml to do that um, which would be the other option so just bear that in mind there is an overlap um, if you want to, to process XML, then you need to use the device admin configuration. And as I said, the first thing to check is that the action is set to submit XML. And then you go to the submit XML field. And you can see here that I have some XML already in there. And this is the XML to enable the show battery percent. Um, I think when I mentioned earlier, the actual values, I've got it the wrong way around. So one is enable and two is disable. So just bear that in mind. It's quite easy to forget that, which is why I put it in the actual tool. Um, if the parameter is set to one, it's going to be enabled, two is disabled. So going back to that option here, I've got it the percent set to enabled currently. If you look at my device through visor, you can see I've got the, the battery indication as a percent. So if I change this to two and then hit submit, what should happen is that it should then save that configuration. When I hit, doesn't actually apply it yet. When I hit the save button, it should apply it to my device. And what you should see is that the 
uh, if I get the right window, the percent battery percent display will go away. So let me just try that. Let me get rid of this window. So hit save, and it should take a, just a few seconds, and then you should see that that percent sign goes away. If it was working. And there you go. So that's one of the nice things about the WYSI implementation is that when you make a change to a profile and you push it out to a device or a group of devices, the change is virtually instant. Whereas if you've worked with some other EMM tools, quite often there can be quite a delay and sometimes a, a variable delay before the change is actually applied. So from a test point of view, when you're you want to test something, it's quite nice that you have that sort of instant um, application of that of that XML or that profile change. And just to show you with that particular setting, so if I go back into my OEM config profile and I um, go back into device admin, If I um, delete my XML from there, and then I go to the general UI configuration, which is here, then I should have the same setting available here, which um, if I can find it, show battery percent notification bar. So I've got it turned off at the moment. I'm going to turn it on and hit submit and then go back to the screen hit save and again it should apply it but just instead of through xml it's now going to apply it just through um using the the um general ui section of the oem config profile so doing the same thing just two different ways to do that um just also want to show you if you look at another piece of XML, we've got some examples here which we're going to run through. But say the Bluetooth power control. Now on my device at the moment, Bluetooth, you can see from the status, is on. So if I want to turn that off, then this XML here will do that. So I can just copy that. And I can paste it, go back into that config. And go back to device admin. Just check my action is still set to submit, which it is. And then paste that in here. And then submit. And you should see a value set to two, which, as we said before, is disabled. So when I hit save, it should turn off the Bluetooth on this device. And uh, that's an example of a parameter that's available in XML, which isn't available through the other options in that list. So that's a case where, you know, you're kind of forced to using XML because you don't have the same option available in the other OEM config parameters. Um, you can actually search for a particular feature. But within the WYSI implementation, when you do that, it's only really searching on the top level. It doesn't search through all the sub layers. So it's a little bit limited in terms of searching for a feature. If you want to see what features are available, best way to do that is on our Tech Docs website. We have um, a new section for OEM config, and that covers all the feature set if you go to manage configurations. So that's basically a full list of very long web page. You can search that just by looking there. So show battery percentage, it tells you where that is in terms of the, the features. Um, so that can be useful if you want to check if a particular features it's supported in OEM config. You're searching that page and that will 
confirm that. So let's go back to um, the right folder. So that was looking at, at actually deploying this XML through WYSI. And as I've said, you know, most of the EMMs, it will be a very similar experience in terms of configuring OEM config, um, maybe slightly different UI, but pretty much the same. And so I also want to show you the other tools we talked about. So in this case, I have currently got Bluetooth off my device. As you can see here. So here I've got the same Bluetooth code, but with the value set to enable. So I can push that to the device through ADB. So my device is connected through cable. And I can say start stage now. As you can see it's started up. And then if I just move that, I don't know if I can show you both at the same time, but if I scan that barcode now, that's going to process the XML that I've just pushed onto the device. For some reason it's not reading that very well. Um, so staging successful and now Bluetooth should have gone to enable, but it didn't, which is not what I was expecting. Let's just try that again. Start stage now. A new demo gremlins will get me somewhere. Okay, so it is enabled there now. I don't know why it didn't work the first time. If I change that to a two and push it again to the device, Start stage now again. Read the barcode. And it's disabled. So you just about see there. So it does work. And uh, that's the method using the tool, doing the syntax check. Said so just loads it into a browser so you can see immediately if you've got any syntax errors. And so then the, the alternative to that as I was talking about, was to um, basically just use a text editor. So if I open that in Notepad, you can see that's the raw XML. I can make changes to that. So yeah, add something in the comment, save, and then I can push that onto the device. Actually, I want to use that one because Bluetooth is currently off. So I'm going to send that to copy it to my XML. So it's just sending it to this batch file in order to copy it through ADB to that particular file name and path. And then I can read the same barcode. And if I show you the screen, what should happen now is that the Bluetooth should go on again. I can just get my windows lined up. And you can see it's enabled again. So, you know, pretty easy to and fast to to change something and to deploy it using that method or either of those methods because they are basically exactly the same. It's just that um, you can pick and choose which one is you prefer really. So, going back to the slides, um, just want to go through some examples now of some XML, exported XML that can be useful. So one of the things which um, has become an issue really since we released the TC2126 is that we have to install software licenses on those devices in particular for the mobility DNA enterprise functionality, which a lot of customers require. Um, but we also use the licensing system for some of the add-on applications like um, PTT Express and Enterprise Browser. And we have added support for that uh, licensing within um, MX. So as a license manager, CSP. And that allows us then to do automatic licensing, provided the device has an IP connection and a, and a path to the cloud server. It's probably the easiest way to get a license onto the device 
So the process is you purchase the license, you will get an entitlement um, code, and that code you can use to um, within the license manager CSP to license that device for that particular product. So let's just see how that looks. So because I've got a live license, I'm not going to show you the actual license. I've got one here with it kind of redacted. <laughs> but you can see here the, the format of the XML. Basically, the license manager CSP, I set the license action to activate. License source is Zebra Cloud. And that would be my activation ID and the quantity of licenses to activate. So it's pretty straightforward. So if I want to test that, this is the same XML, but with the actual live license code. So I can just push that to um, my device. Which I've done there. So just to show you on my device, if I go to license manager, uh, you can see there's no licenses currently. So I'm going to run stage now. I'm going to scan my barcode. Um, so I might use this one because this one I can make a little bit bigger. It should probably read a bit better. So this is the same barcode as we've got embedded there, just in a in the original document. So show you the screen of the device here. So I read the barcode, I'm just going to process that XML. And now if I go out of here and run license manager. You can see it's it's acquired that mobility DNA valuation license. So obviously I wouldn't do that on this particular device because this is a TC52, which doesn't need that license. But if that was a either a 21, 26, or an MC 2200, 2700, then that would be a common requirement to have that license available. And in the same way, I can. Um, I can put that license back if I say deactivate. So it's basically very similar XML, but with it set to deactivate the license. So if I copy that to the device, um, scan the, let's just come out of there, scan the barcode again. And after that's that basically takes that license, puts it back onto the license server, so it's then available for redeployment to another device. So then if I look there, and you can see there's no products with um, or no like no licensed products anymore. So say so that's a, a very easy way to um, to license a device. Uh, useful feature of using OEM config is if I was to do that in WYSI, either within, I could use the um, license manager. I think there's a section here for licensing. Um, so I've forgotten where it is. One of these should cover licensing. Let's spell it in this. No, I'm sure one of the features here is a license deployment, but um, let's say I was to do it through XML. Um, so I would go to submit XML. I would just copy that um, same code. So I'd copy the code from this file, paste it into here. And then when I submit it, it, it will do the same thing. It will push the, the profile to the device and license it, but it will persist this profile. So what that means is if I then do a complete reset, an enterprise reset of the device, and then it reconnects or re-enrolls with WYSI, it will reapply that profile and it will then give me that license back. So it kind of, once you've set that up as an OEM config profile in that way, then it will persist, you know, regardless of the state of the device, if it's reset or not, it will still redeploy that license assuming it's always got the, the IP connection with the license server. Um, second example, so 
some customers for security reasons may not want to use Gboard because Google does some stuff whereby they look at characters typed on the keyboard and try and use it to to capture advertising keywords. So there's a blog I've posted here which talks about using replacement and that's called OpenBoard. It's on Google Play, but the source code is also on GitHub. So you can check, you know, obviously that with a, a keyboard, it's quite a sensitive piece of software because, you know, obviously you could type in any information on that keyboard. So you need to make sure that that's not going to a third party server. And because it's open source, obviously you can check that. Um, and you can easily enable this and set this as the default um, input method. So I'm going to show you that XML here. So in this case, um, firstly, I just need, I'm just going to install the open keyboard through ADB, just so it's on the device. So that will just install the APK file, but it won't actually enable it as the input method. And that's what this XML is going to do. So that's succeeded. If I look at that with Notepad, what you can see is it does two things. First thing is it disables Gboard, which is the Google input. So it's just going to disable that, so it's not available as an input method. And it's, then it's using UI Manager to set the default input method to the open board. So you just have to specify the package name and the class name. And basically what that means is that when I pop up any uh, field which requires keyboard entry. You can see at the moment it's going to pop up Gboard. Hopefully, let's go to Chrome. So Gboard's coming up, and I don't have any other op keyboard options. So I'm going to push this onto the device just using um, my patch file copy to the device and then I'm going to go to my stage now barcode, show you the screen of the device. So I'll run stage now, read that barcode and that should now change the input to open board. You can see there. So and also no also again there's no keyboard selector icon so this is the the only input method that's enabled um and if you look at it in terms of its functionality it's very similar to the keyboard that's the standard in aosp or if you enable uh, gms restricted mode you get a very similar sort of basic plain vanilla keyboard which doesn't do anything uh, that you don't want it to so that's enable that. If I want to re-enable Gboard, um, again, I can just push this XML to the device. This is just going to reset the, or re-enable the um, Gboard keyboard method. So I'll push that onto the device. I can read the barcode again. See the device screen. And now when I get to a uh, input field, you see I've got the pop up now and I can reselect Gboard as the default. So it's very easy to do that, uh, swapping of keyboard, default keyboards through that method. Um, next example is um, if you want to pre-grant the display over other apps permission, so some apps will require this permission, which normally you have to to grant manually. So this application is a is a dash cam um, app, which will basically allow you to record what you can see in front of the device if it's in a cradle in a car. And it's just an application from Google Play, and it requires normally manually granting the allow display over other apps permission. So one of the nice features of MX is we can pre-grant that permission. Uh, it just requires a little bit of extra effort. So what we do in this case is to 
Um, let's go to the right folder. Access manager permissions. So there's a couple of steps required, which I think I've got outlined here. Um, first thing is I need to know the package name. Uh, and I've got a little batch file there, which will just pull out the package name. And then I need to use our SigTools Java library in order to extract the APK signature into a separate file in Base64 format. The reason for that is if you look at the actual code, the XML code, um, it needs to have the, the package name, or that, sorry, that's the permission that I'm going to grant. That's the package name that I need to use or that's the application that will have the permission granted. And then this is the base 64 version of the application signature. So um, to get those, let me show you that quickly. I go here, I've got the um, APK info batch file. So I just pass the APK file name and it's basically dumping out the information about the app, but the, right at the top, you can see here, it's got the package name. So that is what I use to put into the first field, which you can see there, the actual package name. And then the second step is to use the batch file get sig, and then I can use the name of the application, but without uh, the APK extension. And you have to have Java installed on your machine for that to work. But what it will do then is to extract the certificate as a CRT file. If you look at the contents of that, it's a long string of characters, but you just basically do a copy of that, paste it into your um, XML between the quotes. So you just do a paste there, and that basically then will make sure that when Access Manager processes this, that it's got the correct certificate that matches this application in order to grant it, pre-grant this draw over other apps permission. So just going to show you that in operation then. So I need to just install the app first, which I'm going to do again, just pushing it through ADB. And then I'm going to take my XML and just push that onto the device with that one. And then if I read the barcode, it should apply that XML. And it did, but I got an error. So let me just do a quick edit of that. I think um, we need to please delete that because it's already installed. Let me just try that. So push that to the device. And I need the barcode again. Okay, so I've got success there. So exit from that and then start the application, which is the dash camera. Um, just agree in terms of use. Um, I've got to do the manual confirmation of the other permissions because I installed it through ADB and I didn't grant the permissions through ADB. Um, if you install that app through MX, it will automatically grant these permissions which is another advantage of MX. Um, but if I hit record now, what it should do is just allow me to, to record immediately. If I didn't grant that permission, it would pop up the, the screen that you saw in the slide, which will be this one. Um, but because it's been pre-granted, that's gone away. So I can start using the app immediately. So let's go back to there. We'll just stop that. So that's how you would uh, pre-grant draw over other app permissions through XML. Um, 
Uh, next example is, is using a combination of different MX calls to, to restrict the, permission, the um, access to settings. So what we can do is to actually reduce the settings so that you can only adjust the, the display brightness. And then if you hit the settings icon, you just get this limited list here. So it basically stops people from accessing settings that you don't want them to. So the XML to do that, you can see here. Um, just edit that. So basically what we're doing is disabling the notification, or sorry, enabling the notification bar. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one, go to disable first. So we're basically using this call to access manager to enable the restricted settings, which you can see there. Uh, that's the restricted settings list, that's through that call. And then we're going to leave the notification pull down enabled, but to disable the notification settings and the quick icon, quick settings icons as well disabled. So if I push that onto the device, and then process the XML, show you the screen and the device at the same time. So at the moment, you can see I've got full access to settings. If I just enable that code, then you should see that, you should see that it's gone away, but it hasn't. So let me just check, did I send the right one? I set the disable instead of the enable. We do that again. Sent the wrong XML file there. So process that. And then check. And you can see now I can adjust my brightness and I can just access the three settings there. So um, the only disadvantage really doing that I can see is that once you do that, you can't access the settings. Uh, programmatically. So if I was to go to uh, enable restricted settings, if I was to run this batch file, which will normally call up the Bluetooth settings, it says on the device, it's giving me a message that says that it's blocked by MX. Let's see if I can show you that to you. OSX admin disabled, so I can't jump direct to the Bluetooth settings, for example, which could be a disadvantage. So if you want to do a slightly less strict lockdown settings, then I can basically apply this XML, which is going to allow full settings, but just remove the notification settings icon. So let me just apply that quickly to the device and then process that. And once I've done that, I've still got access to the settings icons, but I've got no settings cog to actually go through the um, into the more detailed settings. So it gives you access just to whatever you've defined as being accessible through the quick settings icons. Um, and if you want to disable everything and put it back to how it was, you can just deploy that one, which will give me full access to settings again. So just read the barcode to do that. And then I should have my full settings access back. Um, start to run out of time but let me just go back to here so um i'm just going to to walk through these quickly because i just want to leave a few minutes at the end for questions but uh the other examples access manager we can use to set up a white list of applications very easily so if you look at the the xml to do that um where is that gone whitelist. 
So in this case, all you do is to list out the package names that you want to be whitelisted. So all the pre-installed apps are on the whitelist by default. These apps that you add to, to the list are then added as allowed apps. And what that means is only those applications can run on the device and anything not in that whitelist will be blocked. And when you try and install a, a non-whitelisted app, you'll get a message that says there's a user restriction applied. So basically it means you can lock down a device to only the applications that you deploy when you first commission the device just by applying that XML and um, you know keeping the application package names in that list. So it's a very easy way to do a, um, a blocking of non-approved apps. Um, Sable Zebra Analytics, it's a simple one. It allows you to, if you look on the device, we have the analytics engine, which is running only by default, as you can see there. And if you want to turn that off programmatically, because some customers are not happy about um, data going outside their, um, their network, you can just set analytics manager to two and that will disable that. So if I push that onto the device and then process it, uh, then you should see immediately that will show you my device screen. When you look at Zebra Analytics, you see it's been disabled. And I just wanted to point out, you could probably see when I did that, showed that quickly, this is commented out. But if I want to persist this over a enterprise reset, all I have to do is to uncomment that code. And this will use Persist Manager to basically make this setting or any other settings which precede it persist over an enterprise reset. So if I add that step at the end of any XML profile, what it means is that profile then becomes enterprise reset persistent. And that means it will boot up after an enterprise reset and the, the settings will be reapplied automatically. And uh, last but not least, really, um, you can use intents to enable and disable Rx logger and also to export Rx logs. So um, this can be useful because some EMMs don't support file upload. So with this method, what you can do is to, and I've got three examples of the code required. So if I go to um, control Rx logger, then I can enable Rx logger through this intent, just Rx logger intent action enable, and I can disable it through this one, disable. And this one will basically, what it's doing is it sends a broadcast to tell Rx logger to back up. So first step would be to enable Rx logger. And then when you have an issue through your EMM, you can push out this code, which will say back up the current Rx log. Then there's a pause here to allow time for the backup to complete. So this is just doing a five second loop. And then it will basically call file manager. And this is a path to an FTP server I've got. So that when I basically um, make this call, it's going to take the latest exported log, which was exported at this step, and it's going to push it to that server. So I can basically collect that log. I can both export it and collect the log in one action in an EMM which doesn't support file upload. So it can be quite useful, especially if you're doing troubleshooting of a, an issue and it's only happening occasionally, what you could do is when you get a call, you can, well, first enable Rx logger selectively on some devices, and then when you get a call from a user, you can export and gather the log from that, that device. And then finally, last example, I think, is the lifeguard install. And this is really just allowing you to install a lifeguard patch. Um, show you that code very quickly. So in this case, we just use condition manager to check for the battery level being more than 30%. So if it 
if it's less than 30 percent the patch won't be applied so it immediately exits at that point and gives an error in the staging profile or in the emm um, return code but if it is higher than 30 percent then it will download the patch file and apply it through power manager in this case as an upgrade so again for an emm that doesn't support photo or doesn't support um, you know os updates um, zebra os updates then you can work around that with that sort of xml and that is it i'm a little bit over time i think stacy right on top of the yeah. hour we're going to have uh, not a lot of time for questions, so let me just pick out a couple. And then, Ian, I think what we can do is the questions that we have today, I can download those. We can post your responses onto the blog on our developer portal where we posted the, um, the presentation. The presentation will also be in a PDF format on that blog, and then eventually we'll have um, a link to the, uh, the YouTube video, which is a recording of today's session. Um, but um, I'll just give you a couple of questions to start today. Does that sound good? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Is the OEM config app only available via Play Store or also available as an APAC file? APK file. Uh, it's only available from Play. Um, and normally it only makes sense that it's available through Play because it has to be loaded through an EMM profile anyway, really, for it to be usable. So, yeah only through play okay do we need to do anything special on the oem config app that installed that is installed on an android device no no basically all that happens is it's normally through the emm it's pushed onto the device and then just sits there and runs in the background to support you know this um, oem config method but yeah you don't need to do anything Okay, why doesn't OEM config match stage now slash EMDK? That's a good question. The reason is, and the reason there's a difference between the feature set of stage now and OEM config is because what we try to do is where there's a Google provided API to do something that was originally done in MX, we've taken it out of OEM config. So the idea is that anything that can't be done through a google api should be an oem config but otherwise it will be through a google method okay. Let's see. using xml with oem config can we perform multiple settings within xml like turn on the bluetooth display to 30 yeah. minutes etc yeah you okay. can um and that's a good question again because you can do multiple steps, and that's one of the advantages of doing an XML is it's easy to combine the steps. Uh, there does seem to be a limit on the, the size of the XML that you can process, which I haven't exactly defined yet. But I think if you took a very large chunk of XML and tried to process it that way, it's not going to work. So you've got to keep it. If you've got, say, three or four steps, that seems to be OK. But if it's larger than that, then you'd need to break it down into multiple OEM config transactions. Okay. I'll give you a link to the developer portal. So that's no problem. Um, can you test a full save stage now profile with multiple CSP settings that usually create the multiple barcodes in the XML tester? Does that make sense? Yeah. Any any profile that you can export from stage now you can test with this method because the xml will contain you know the profile itself at the end of the day it contains the xml and the mx layer processes the xml so when you export the xml um, and you process it through this method it's doing the same thing it's just rather than doing it through barcodes or through lots of barcodes you're doing it just by using the raw xml so yes is the answer the short okay answer. <laughs> i i noticed that you are using adb to sideload the xml to the device can we use stage now to send the xml file to the sd card and then execute the xml all in one uh stage now barcode 
Uh, you can't really with Stage Now. Um, there is a method in Stage Now where you can, if you select NFC as the target rather than barcode, it will create a bin file and you can put the bin file onto an SD card. And then within the Stage Now client, you have the option to browse for a local profile. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the equivalent of that. The bin file contains the encoded XML and you can browse for it in the in the stage now client in order to process it. So okay. you can kind of do that, but in a different way. Do we get a copy of the batch files used? So the ones that were that extracts the signature yes. sample? Okay. So I'm gonna put them at this link. So you can download this zip file, it will contain all those batch files and XML samples. Okay, and we can post that link up, up on the developer portal. I'll make sure that blog's in place on front uh, end so we can post a couple of these things too. Yeah. Um, and then I'll email this. I can email everybody on this particular call too, just to give that to them. Uh, when does it become necessary to define multiple tr transaction steps when using OEM config? So it would be necessary if, for example, you, um, going back to one of the previous questions, when I said you want to try and break down large chunks of XML into smaller blocks. So if I had a larger profile, um, I would use, say, two transaction steps with three um, CSP calls in each of the XML um sections on the two transactions so yeah it allows you to build up a more complex configuration rather than trying to do everything in one particular transaction it's you know from a maintenance point of view and from an operational point of view it's better to break it down into a more modular um sequence of transactions um, on the XML, where do we find documentation that explains